Who would win in a fight? Dennis Quaid from Pandorum. So his character from Pandorum, who is like okay. a captain who woke up out of hypersleep. Or was he? Chris Pratt from Passengers, who was a oh. psychotic man <laughs> who murdered Aurora and <laughs> murdered Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> this is a surprisingly <laughs> close match because... I would venture to say that the two characters that you just named are, in fact, the same character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oddly <laughs> I, enough. <laughs> I, I have a small theory write-up I did for that that I'd like to present when you're Dude, done with yours. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking uh, <laughs> Pandorum is like basically a sequel to Passengers, the movie that came way later. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Popcorn Isn't Real. The podcast where we cover fan theories about all sorts of media, books, TV shows, movies, uh, video games. We take deep dives into any sort of fan theory, uh, any sort of alternate interpretation of your favorite stories. We do amazing research. We don't just like read comments off of Reddit. <laughs> we try to figure out what really happened or what might have happened. The person you just heard talking was one of our hosts, Storvald, and I'm the other host, Leif Eric. Some people can tell their voices apart, but most Mo can't. Most people can't. I can. <laughs> In this episode, we're going to be covering the 2009 sci-fi horror known as Pandorum. Uh, one of my favorites. Directed by Christian Albert, who we'll be hearing from today. He has graciously agreed to be on the podcast and share, share some of the uh, facts and tidbits behind the making of the movie. We were able to interview him, and you'll be hearing pieces of that interview throughout this episode. The legend goes that Travis Malloy came up with the original screenplay, and that screenplay was then specifically brought to Christian Albert to direct because he was known to be working on a very similar film already. Apparently, it was titled Nowhere, um, and it was so similar to Pandorum that he was like, whoa, oh, did, did this guy like read my screenplay? What's going on? And then he was able to merge the two screenplays together, his own screenplay and the other one to, to make Pandorum. And I would love to hear Christian Albert's thoughts on this. I would love to hear the backstory on this. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it actually sounds more complicated than it is. Like we smashed two screenplays together, but it was actually, for me, it was way scarier than that. I was meeting the producers of Pandorum on another project. We were talking about some of the Resident Evil parts and all that, and they really liked my movie Antibodies. And um, we didn't come together on anything, but then they sent me the script Pandorum, and I had actually worked on my Nowhere project. And I really had like the opening act and the final act for me was super clear what it needs to be. And it's very much like what ended up in Pandorum, specifically the waking up. Almost like in a dream state mind of mine, I had this, how must it be? It must be so confusing and so weird waking up and not knowing what's going on. And what if it's longer and you, your memory is hazy and all that? You know, I just had this strong imagination. And they sent me the script and the first act and the last act were very, very, very similar to my script. To the point where I was like, I'm fucked now. Because basically, if I don't do their movie, you know, my movie, I can't make it because there's a record of me you know having access to their material and if i do it now will sue me that was before i even made case 39 so i've made one real movie and one amateur movie so i was super young and i was like oh my god these big hollywood producers sent me the script so now my project is that but maybe maybe because i didn't like some of the things uh they're all fine but i didn't like them for me and i didn't want to lose some of the aspects of my script, I went to them and to the writer and, and basically pitched um, my script and what you could do to their script to mesh them together. And and I mean, the main difference is that the the Travis wrote a really cool, I think, I, and I mean that honorably, uh, B movie uh, thriller where it's on a prison ship and there's like a mutiny and one of the guards wakes up and doesn't know that Peyton is a prisoner. You know, so it's very similar in terms of the structure. It's basically a prison riot in space. I always love generational spaceships because if there's no hyperdrive or, or warping of space time or anything, how you would basically have to send out arcs that, that have to keep traveling forever. My script, there was the part that there's like these capsules where three flight crew are in and they rotate like a revolver around and everybody has two years of, of service. 
and then the revolving door switches and the next one comes up. And I just love what if you don't get relief? It was for me, I had, I think, very clear vision of how you could mesh them together without feeling meshed. Some of the critics say it's obvious and there should have been two movies, but I kind of disagree. I think we we worked well together, Travis and I, and made a nice, somewhat elevated uh, project, you know? What I always try to make is a movie that maybe not everybody loves, but for some people, it's the favorite movie. You know, it's not meh, it's not mid. Pandorum is still the movie, even though it bombed, that has the most people coming to me that are really passionate about the movie. No, I, I really feel like Pandorum flew under a lot of people's radars. Um, I hadn't even heard of it until it was already released. 2008 to like 2012 ish like the what a great year for like random horror movies i know <laughs> i mean seriously. sorry a great era for random horror movies <laughs> yeah well uh, <laughs> <it's not> just... <laughs> yeah, you're right that was several years that you just condensed into one year <laughs> man i just saying like that that time period there were tons of random horror movies that came out with yeah, like big yeah, budgets like, like pandora on elm street remake budget. which i know you loved um... <laughs> oh, that's a great <laughs> Hey, you sounded like the new Freddy just then. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, I'll bet you looked like him too. Yeah, my face is just like a melted monkey. <laughs> Dude, I knew you would say it if I if I alluded to it. <laughs> it just seems like that kind of late 2000s, early 2010s had a bunch of random horrors that were actually kind of high in budget. Whereas I think if they were made now, they'd go straight to streaming and they'd be much lower in budget. Oh, yeah, absolutely, so. yeah. I feel like... Some like triple A horror movies that came out just after this uh, in in that era, like for example, Predators, actually drew inspiration from Pandora in a lot of respects. It had kind of the same thing going on with the untrustworthy survivor, you know, luring them in and lulling them into a false sense of security and then betraying them. That that exact same thing happens in both movies. Thinking of Predators and Passengers, were you as baffled as me that that man who shows up was not Lawrence Fishburne? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how not not Lawrence Fishburne he was. It is crazy. <laughs> Lucky for me, I saw Pandorum first, so I was more confused by Lawrence Fishburne when I saw Predators. I was like, haven't I seen this before? <laughs> I don't think a horror, a sci-fi horror movie from that era is complete without Lawrence Fishburne showing up and dying. <laughs> I also love that you seem to include passengers in that era when it's clearly not. not it came out a decade later. <laughs> 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 and also, it's not a horror as much as it should have been. It is not a horror well, movie. I think I thoroughly proved that it was. <laughs> Go listen to our passengers episode. No, I, lo I love Pandorum. Uh, when I saw it a decade ago, immediately it became one of my top sci-fi films of all time. So what is the story of Pandorum? This guy wakes up. His name is Boer, Corporal Boer. And he wakes up in a pod, a cryogenic sleep pod. He comes out. He can barely remember what's going on. He's kind of disoriented. He meets another guy who wakes up from his pod, whose name is Dennis Quaid. <laughs> his name Peyton, is Peyton. Peyton is, Peyton is the name that, that he goes by. They were supposed to be the flight crew for this space expedition that takes 123 years. They're transporting 60,000 passengers to the planet called Tanis that they're going to populate because Earth yeah. is, is gross. And now it's time, time for their shift. And unfortunately, they wake up to find that Chris Pratt has run amok and <laughs> <laughs> they wake up to find that things are weird and other people aren't awake and Eventually, they find out there are like mutants running amok that have taken over the ship and lots of people have been awoken, but there are also still people in their sleep pods. And also like the nuclear reactor drive is malfunctioning and they have to start it back up. Major spoilers. If you haven't seen the movie, go and watch it before we get into the rest of the plot, because there's some huge twists at the end. The important thing that we find out is that this ship actually made it to its destination and has been waiting 900 years or so under an alien ocean to let the passengers off. But one of the passengers, Officer Peyton, went rogue and decided to conduct experiments on the ship, uh, letting passengers out early and watching them fight for survival. This led to a new species evolving over the centuries, uh, other officers not taking over, and the ship not functioning correctly. Um, in the end, Bauer saves the day by forcing the ship to eject all of the remaining hypersleep pods 
they float to the surface and the passengers can colonize and populate this alien planet. It's a happy ending. So you might notice that the title of the movie is Pandorum, but I never even mentioned Pandorum. Well, we covered the plot of the movie. You might be asking yourself, what is Pandorum? Why is this the title of the movie? So they tell us early on in this movie that there is a psychological syndrome called Pandorum that people get in deep space when they've been in cryosleep. And the example they give of this sickness, Pandorum, is a person who came to believe that everything about the ship was cursed or evil and then he was so paranoid that he ejected everyone into space and they all died. He ejected all the cryopods into space. So all the passengers were killed. And that became an infamous example of Pandorum. And it's really hard to spot Pandorum. Sometimes you might have a fever or a temperature. You might be itchy on your skin. But it's characterized by paranoia. Why is that the title of the movie? That didn't happen at all or have anything to do with the events of the movie. Or right. did it? <laughs> well, well, the movie would have you believe that the reason it is important and they do mention it is because that's what set up the movie, right? Like that's the reason everything is happening. Pandorum is what happened before the movie started. But like you said, you can get through the whole movie without even knowing what Pandorum is, yes. like I did, and like not even remembering what it meant or what it had to do with anything. As, well, that as was I the thing that stuck out to me I after I watched it the first time. I was like, Pandorum never came into play. They kept talking about it and alluding to it, but it didn't have anything to do with the plot itself. You might say that Peyton slash Gallo had Pandorum. He didn't do the signature thing of Pandorum, which is eject all the pods out of the ship. He tried mm -hmm, to eject himself a few times, <laughs> but he didn't do it. Um, now, I believe, this is my theory, I believe that the entire movie of Pandorum was actually from Bauer's point of view, that he was suffering the effects of Pandorum the entire time. Uh, I think he woke up as scheduled. I think he went completely nuts. I think he fought the crew, he fought the passengers, and his paranoid delusions kept him from seeing what was really happening. He came to believe that he was on a cursed ship of death, and that he needed to get off, and that he needed monsters. to get everyone off. <laughs> uh, and eventually, I think he did. He ejected all the passengers from the ship in the belief that he was saving them, when in fact he was actually dooming them and also right. dooming humanity forever. I think that that is the secret of this movie, that Bauer had Pandorum and that he killed everybody in the end. The definition they give of Pandorum is essentially someone who ejects all the people <laughs> into space. Yep. And that doesn't happen in this movie, except at the very end when he quote someone unquote saves everyone the by ejecting all the people. Into the ocean and saves them. <laughs> And ever since I watched this movie the first time, like the instant the movie finished, I've been I, ever since then, I've been wanting to ask Christian Albert, the director, <laughs> if in fact Bauer was supposed to have been experiencing Pandorum. And this was not a happy ending, but a tragic ending of the movie. I think, um, you know, the series should be somewhat supported by the text, in this case, the movie and. <laughs> I think it would be very bad filmmaking if something that is in the head of one character ends with superimposition of text saying that this is Tanis year zero. I think the text is not supporting the theory. I mean, there's many interesting theories and some of them are spot on. But again, <laughs> the, the kind of uncertainty where this theory is derived from, that's on purpose because that's the one of the challenges for these guys is like okay i cannot trust myself what i like is uh, today in, in in this world where the internet you know the truth comes harder to get by and to basically not trust yourself and try to logically deduce what is bullshit and where you have biases <laughs> and where you basically might have going down the wrong rabbit hole i think that's interesting uh, even today almost 15 years later that you have to be able to check your own sanity from time to time so Pandorum is also known as Orbital Dysfunctional Syndrome. How can I prove that he was suffering from Orbital Dysfunctional Syndrome? Well, I'm going to go through the movie and I'm going to present all the evidence that I could find in chronological order, as well as just my thoughts on the movie as usual. Great. Strap into your cryogenic sleeping pod 
Oh, I'm strapped in. Make sure you don't eject yourself into the empty vastness of space. The very first thing we hear is a message being transmitted to the ship. You're all that's left of us. Good luck. God bless. We cut to a strange hallucination of a pale lady all in white in a white room whispering, I love you, but you can't hear what she's whispering. You can just read her lips. And then Corporal Bauer waking up from his cryo sleep. I think all of that was his coma induced dream. Um, I think that the message from Earth was a reflection of his worries as he uh, entered into cryosleep. Um, I think that his uh, dream about his ex-wife was also clearly a reflection of his worries. I think just the way that it's edited together, it makes sense that all of this is going on in his head. Uh, this movie is very much steeped in hard sci-fi. I love uh, when he wakes up that you can see like the extra layers of dead skin slawing off his body. <laughs> How do you pronounce slawing? S L O U G. Sloughing with it. With sloughing. The extra layers of dead skin sloughing off his body. Uh, his long nails, his hair, his beard that has grown. I think there's just such amazing attention to the details in this. He movie. shaves his beard with a laser razor. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a laser razor. It's so cool. Dude, me too. <laughs> I just like you wonder, have to like, very carefully if he put not it touch too your close skin to his it. skin, would it shave his face off? Like, because <laughs> he has to very carefully put it extremely close, but not touch the skin. <laughs> yes, like it, it has to have like a focal distance, right? So if he moves it incorrectly, then it's just going to cut through him. <laughs> also, I have to note that apparently Christian Albert has a director's trademark where he shows a character shaving in three mirrors so that the character Whoa. is visible four times in one shot shaving. <laughs> I don't know. What That's what cool IMDb trademark. says. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's half to. I'd, I had this shot in my first movie. As a, as a little, I don't know, inside thing, I redid that shot a few times, but I stopped the minute it showed up on IMDb. <laughs> it's not your trademark anymore <laughs> i don't know i read it 10 years ago or 12 years ago it's been on there forever and i said you know what if it's on here i should not do it anymore <laughs> <laughs> why do i believe that he's experiencing pandorum from the get-go well first of all he is not just experiencing the amnesiac after effects of hypersleep he is also shaking uncontrollably as he looks around the room and tries to get his bearings not only that, but you will note that there are instructions within his cryo sleep capsule for what should happen, the procedure that should take place when you successfully wake up from cryo sleep. And it includes the nutrition tubes disengaging automatically from you, and then the spinal umbilical uh, disengaging, the door opening automatically, and you getting out of the pod. None of this happens to Bauer. The emergency procedure, which is described underneath that, happens to him. It says emergency procedure. If the door does not open, then you need to do this. And it says take off your respirator, the, the breathing thing, which he does. He, he actually follows the emergency procedure step by step. It's really good. Again, the attention to detail in this movie is amazing. And then it says to find the emergency disengage button on the right side of the pod. And you can see he first he fumbles around with the umbilical on his back and then he immediately reaches over on the sides of the pod and fiddles around until suddenly it disengages. And then it says, wait till the door opens and then manually remove the nutrition tubes from your arm. And I just thought this was really cool because that's how he gets out of his pod doing the emergency, uh, emergency procedure. But when Lieutenant Peyton wakes up later, you can see that it actually, the entire procedure is different from when Bauer wakes up. The door opens and the extendable robotic spinal umbilical, it gently lowers him out of the chamber and then disconnects. He has already had the, uh, the nutrition tubes removed from his arms automatically, um, just like it was described in you know, the standard procedure for exiting your cryopod. So I just thought that was kind of cool that you can see something went wrong with Bauer's pod. Yeah, there's two different uh, things at play here. First of all, um, Bauer, if he would have waited like 30 oh, more seconds, he was just too fast. Robot arm would have 
would have lowered it. I, I actually, I haven't seen the movie in a while and I don't know if it's still in there. Uh, I have to check it because it was in there for a long time and maybe still is. He turns basically after he's dropped on the floor, Bauer, he looks around in one of the early cuts and definitely in the script. And uh, then the arm comes yeah. out and tries to that drop That was in it, a deleted which scene. Which I thought yeah. was funny. I... <laughs> yeah, that's a deleted mm. moment, you know, and that's because he was just too freaking out too much. And then you have to remember that Peyton doesn't wake up for the first time. He's been doing this again and again. So he's kind of an old pro, uh, you know, even if it's subconsciously, but he's done this uh, many times. I got you. That makes sense. But I also have to note that all of the props and sets in this movie just seem so sturdy and like real and like, you know, like hard. And also they spend the ending credits just like showing you, look at all the cool props and sets we made. Yeah, and they're, they're one CG, you know, you can see what's there actually. No, and the cool thing is like, this feels like an actual ship that was built to last for generations. Like nothing seems fake or aesthetic. It's all industrial, hard, real, like solid metal. After he, he tries to disengage Peyton's pod, he then he just goes and grabs a pipe and starts beating on the front of his pod. And the actor is just like swinging away. Like you can see that the, the glass on the front of the pod gets like all scraped up and scuffed from him beating on it. And I'm like, wow, like they, they built some heavy duty stuff for this movie. <laughs> like I said, I had this, this really strong haunting vision of what of this waking up scene so i was particularly in love with that so i made that set extra thought out i mean there were so many um versions of it until i i was really happy and uh, also there's the birth of gallo a young gallo later on top of the waking up so this was all very thought out and very much built to last but uh, to be honest whenever there was something that wasn't solid i solidified it in post like i i was you know, if there's like a shake that shouldn't be there, then I just uh, froze the image so that it wouldn't shake. It is super important. Just another indication that things didn't quite go right for Bauer and uh, another hint that we have as to maybe why he's experiencing such uh, heavy after effects to his uh, cryo sleep. Uh, when he is getting dressed uh, on the inside of his locker, there is a hypersleep disorientation recovery procedure. And it looks like what you're supposed to do after you come out of hypersleep is do 15 A bunch of yoga. yoga poses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'll, uh, very short We can point. only see 12. I just want to point out but I think that he does not do them. And no. he doesn't seem to recover from disorientation that quickly. Exactly. Perhaps ever. I, I think this has something to do with his heightened uh, emotional state and his stress levels. I think it's cool that the uh, solution to psychosis pandorum is apparently just yoga. It's yoga. <laughs> I mean, that <laughs> makes sense, right? Like, again, I love how everything in this movie is like it, it, it has roots in real life. Like, OK, people woke up and are feeling stressed. How can we reduce the stress? Yoga. <laughs> yoga yeah. is great for stress reduction, right? Like, <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah. I just think that's cool. And, you know, that's probably why he didn't get his memory back so fast. And it's probably what led to him experiencing such a hefty bout of Pandorum <laughs> throughout the rest of the movie. He should have done his yoga. I'm amazed that virtually everything in the ship can be powered by hand cranks. Yeah, <laughs> well, like, dude. Just 20 watch. hand cranks mm -hmm. can power like a whole console for like 20 minutes. Dude, <laughs> <It's> yes. crazy. <laughs> Peyton's like, well, at least we can get this console working. And then he opens up a hatch, which reveals an emergency crank generator. And Bauer's like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And he gets it up to 100% power with like just a couple cranks. I mean, yeah, this I is like the most 20. efficient crank ever. <laughs> like I've had like it's crankable like... flashlights and crankable radios. You have to constantly crank them. If you stop, they don't work anymore. <laughs> but this one, he just cranks a couple times and it, it's it's good to go. <laughs> Not only is there no loss in energy, I think it somehow creates it's like more energy creating than more expended. energy, yes. <laughs> It's like everything is so high tech and yet everything works well, like yeah. a crank. Either that or glow sticks. Um, this ship loves <laughs> glow sticks. As Bauer is getting ready for his trip through the tubes filled with more tubes, um, <laughs> he grabs a ton of glow sticks uh, and he puts them in his pocket. But I love it because, again, that's exactly what you would want in a gigantic enclosed vessel with no power. Uh, you know, if there is an emergency situation, logically, you need something that can create light under its own influence, because this ship is never going to get 
you know, help from outside. Glow sticks and cranks. It's a fantastic backup. There's a lot of discussions uh, behind the scenes. What um, is too smart and what is too dumb for the audience? You know, and I was very adamant that it all has to make sense for us and we cannot cheat and all the technology has to work and all that stuff. And I I almost dare people that think that it's dumb to discuss with me about all the plot holes because we were really, really going into the science of stuff. Where's the power coming from, from your console? You know, after hundreds and thousands of years, how do you work it? So the whole design of the ship was not to look super sleek and super sci-fi, but to make it durable. You know, like this has to hold for, for thousands of years of traveling time. So everything is not to make you comfy or to look cool. It's to um, basically withstand radiation, withstand uh, stress. You know, the ship is supposed to land on the planet, which is a major thing for something so big. I mean, it's just uh, we a lot of thought went into all the science, even including the gravity where it comes from and all that. Kind I was going to ask about that because I've always felt like that's kind of a bit of a plot hole, how they all wake up on this ship and they have gravity. Shouldn't they wonder where that gravity is coming from? No, it's a cloud. When you look at the model, there's rotating okay, sections yeah. of the of the uh, ship. The thing is that, yes, there's gravity because, I mean, spoiler alert, but they're on the yeah. planet. So there is gravity, but the gravity is not always towards the floor. And that's why sometimes some uh, uh, stages are built uh, with an angle or, um, you know, sideways because, you know, there's something wrong. And if they had not so much stress and more time to figure it out, they would yeah. actually deduce at some point they must be on a planet. But be but because they're being chased right. by monsters, there's no time. <laughs> yeah, during those scenes, they have a lot of other things on their mind <laughs> than, than the gravity, they have a different gravity of the situation. Peyton, the supposed commanding officer, there are a lot of hints that he is not who he says he is. As he is, you know, kind of like rolling around on the ground and, you know, just kind of getting his bearings, um, eventually he gets up and kind of heads over to his locker. Uh, they flash Peyton's tattoo at the camera, and you can see that it says FLT 04-012. Of course, Bauer's tattoo we saw earlier was FLT-005-015. Bauer explains later on that 005 stands for Flight Team 5. And he does this as he shows his tattoo to Peyton to verify, you know, not only we are on Flight Team 5, but also verify his own identity to Peyton. And I think this is just fantastic because after Bauer shows his tattoo to Peyton, we feel like we have verified both of their identities. We feel like, oh, yeah, OK, these guys are on Flight Team 5. We know that. But really, only Bauer has ever validated his own identity. Like I said, you see Peyton's tattoo and you can see that it has the wrong flight number. So literally anybody who is just paying extra attention might, you know, already from here be able to figure out that something's wrong. And this guy is not with the right flight team. When Peyton is looking through his locker, he squints confusedly at the picture of his own wife. <laughs> indicating that he's like, who in the heck is this? <laughs> like, I don't know her. And then as he's getting dressed, he keeps fiddling and fiddling with his wedding ring, like trying to push it onto his finger. And it's not fitting right because <laughs> it's not <laughs> his wedding ring. They're, yeah. they're just really, really good tiny details that this guy is right. absolutely not who he says he is. But he doesn't <laughs> quite know it yet because he's also right. experiencing a little amnesia. And that is another cool thing that I like about it, that the main bad guy isn't the main bad guy for like the first half of it because he doesn't, well, he, he doesn't even he know he's Peyton. the main guy. The bad <laughs> he guy. thinks yeah, he's he Lieutenant thinks he's the commanding officer. <laughs> Just yeah, if you pay attention, and of course, this is a testament to Dennis Quaid's acting ability. <laughs> I was going to say, so this is a weird random thing. You kept saying how much you love Pandorum, and for some reason... I kept wanting to say that's just because Dennis Quaid is in it. And I was like, why do I want to say that? And then I remembered it's because I believe I was watching Enemy Mine with oh, dude. at some point. Wow. <laughs> and, I was going and, to watch that to prepare for this. <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't. Um, Mom said something about she kept saying how Dennis Quaid, like she's like, oh, he just reminds me so much of Torvald. He's like, such whoa, a, <laughs> he, he seems so much like Torvald to me, <laughs> like Torvald when he's older. <laughs> Dude, that's so weird because like when Dennis Quaid like gets the console running by cranking the generator, 
And uh, Bauer is just like blown away by how smart he, Peyton is. <laughs> Peyton looks back at him and just has like the most pretentious smile. Like, yeah, I am that cool. And when he did that, I was like, oh, man, that's so something I would do. <laughs> like, I was like, that is a Torvald smile. He's so full of himself. Oh, my God. <laughs> I guess mom's oh, right. Man. That's <laughs> hilarious. I can't believe you said that. <laughs> but no, this is a testament to his acting ability because um, you can see as he starts kind of like trying to take control of the situation and giving orders to uh, to Bauer, who is, you know, being a good soldier and faithfully waiting for orders. Uh, you can see that Peyton's struggling with everything he asked Bauer to do. He like he's not quite sure and he's kind of trying things and he's like making it up as he goes along. And he's like, I should be able to do this, but I don't feel like a commander for some reason because <laughs> he's not. He never was a commander. All he did was kill his two crewmates and then do a bunch of crappy experiments and then go back to sleep. So by your theory... Does Peyton slash Gallo exist? No, did... and, and by my theory, um, this is all just uh, Bauer's delusion, basically. Okay, so Bauer is also Peyton. Yeah. Well, and this, I was going to say, there's evidence of, you know, like characters kind of sharing the same uh, yeah. mental space because there's pl we find plenty out of that evidence Peyton that, and yeah, Gallo are Two the characters same can definitely be one character in this movie. Yeah. So I kind of take it to be that... Um, Basically, Bauer is interacting with crewmates and at times is lucid and doing what they say, as in when he's interacting with Peyton. And then other times is going crazy and like, you know, defending himself and freaking out and you know, <laughs> thinking the ship everybody is overrun is a with mutants. <laughs> well, I think uh, his delusion is making itself up as it goes along. It's like a nightmare, right? It's like a bad dream where things kind of just don't make sense, but then they start to actually make sense as the bad dream keeps going because your mind kind of latches onto things and you learn something in your dream and then you make a connection and you're like, oh, that's what's happening, right? Like at first he's just like, what if there were aliens on this ship? What if there were monsters? And he starts seeing aliens everywhere. And then he's like, oh, what if the monsters were like evolved humans, <laughs> right? And the delusion <laughs> yeah. just grows from there. Bauer makes his way through the tube filled with tubes. He starts to freak out. Basically, he's getting claustrophobic. The cool part is that uh, he's having a panic attack. And Peyton, over the, over the radio, uh, calms him down with a legitimate anti-panic attack technique. Um, where he you, a joke. <laughs> when someone is having a, a panic attack, you ground them by saying something that is humorously ridiculous. Peyton says... This might not be the best time to tell you, but I got the door open. <laughs> and then Bauer's like, are you kidding me? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and then as they laugh, Bauer visibly calms down, uh, which is, of course, excellent acting, but also excellent writing. I thought that was really cool because that's a legitimate technique. Uh, if you find someone having a panic attack, tell them an absurd joke and it might help them to kind of ground themselves in reality. Another technique that I know from experience is you can turn on quote unquote calming ASMR music. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so creepy because it's just like disembodied voices whispering to you and you can't quite hear what they say. The person having a panic attack just starts laughing because it's so stupidly creepy. I love ASMR music. <laughs> it's so it's good. Not music. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Uh. There's actually some really cool, unnerving things that very subtly feed into the psychological idea that perhaps none of this is happening throughout this movie. And that's the way the ship connects together. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense to yeah. me that no. a ventilation tube full of tubes <laughs> would lead into a to shoe a locker. Boot locker. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah, it leads yeah. into a locker there should no there should not be ventilation there there's no need it's it's a storage space and the other time that i think is really cool is when after he meets man the the vietnamese guy he's walking down a hallway and then the hallway comes out in a large storage container why yes. would a hallway connect to a storage container? That doesn't make yeah. any sense whatsoever. Like, the ship is is wa wacky, crazy, crazy well, town. It's Hallways and, don't 
<laughs> just connect to, to shipping containers. You're supposed to be able to lift those and move them around and stuff. Well, right. And this is actually a good a good time to go over this. I was going to mention that a lot of the cuts in this movie seem to be deliberately odd, like what you yeah, just described. There's where some very shows, strange camera it angles It shows and one editing. situation, <laughs> and then it cuts and shows the same situation, but everything's different, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, like what you described, where he's in a hallway, cut, now it is a storage container. Um, that <laughs> exact same thing happens in this scene. He opens up the ventilation shaft and falls out. And then he says that he is in a, a, a boot storage. And then he suddenly falls sideways out of it. And it is just like a boot locker. But then he doesn't call it a boot locker. <laughs> he says, oh, yeah, actually, it, it was a side hatch or a side panel or something. He falls out with a bunch of boots. He which does. Is so the proof it was that it was a boot, was a boot storage, locker, yes. which is what he thought it was, even though the boots weren't initially apparent to begin with. Yes. But once they are apparent, he changes his mind. <laughs> yes. It, the whole scene is just weird. And it, it just strikes me as like as many other scenes in this movie, yeah. as if it's trying to throw you off, like as yeah. if it was intentionally made weird. The director of this movie, Christian Albert, I've heard that he storyboarded every like he personally <laughs> like visually storyboarded every single scene in the movie and he had like 215 pages of storyboards no that's not enough <laughs> no even more <laughs> that is def- no no that's not enough it must be like more i don't know you know what is the storyboard book has like four shots uh on a page and pfft, Probably three thousand images were drawn oh, um, for that, and that was in the. I mean, I'm I'm way more um, uh, experienced now, so I I don't need to storyboard everything anymore. But in the beginning, I can only recommend if you if you care about visual storytelling and position the camera right, and there's there's no more stress on your movie than on set for time. Mm. You know, time is your great enemy. You have a specific uh, amount of uh, days, and you have a specific amount of hours. So I'm not a big fan of figuring it out on the set. And that still exists. Um, I had one storyboard artist who's been with me for a long time. He also did Case 39 and Antibodies and um, even some unrealized projects. If you uh, check out a movie of mine called Antibodies, um, there's a featurette where the first hour of the movie, and then I ran out of time to do it, I had to encode it myself, but the first hour you can subtitle it with the storyboards. Wow. I've never seen That's that so done cool. anywhere, but on the DVD of Antibodies, if if you like, there's subtitle like English, German, and then storyboard, and every shot has the corresponding storyboard so cool. where you see where we changed it and where we don't. And I suggested that for Pandorum as well, but for some reason I don't think it ended up like I did the the work, but I don't think it's on. The you DVD did the work, and they reason. didn't include it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that yeah. sucks. Well, that's really cool. I'm going to have to get a DVD of, uh, of antibodies because I would love to watch it with the storyboard subtitles. To me, that was the Bible, the storyboard. Like the actors in the movie, they, in, I've seen interviews where they talk about it and they're like, yeah, it was so weird to have a movie where literally everything was storyboarded, not just the action scenes, but everything. And they said, that's just the way Christian Albert works. Um, he, he plans literally everything out from start to finish for every single scene so that you go in, you knock out the scene, he knows exactly what he wants and you get it. And that leads me to believe that these strange cuts were exactly what he wanted. He storyboarded them yeah. that way. He, he wanted it to be odd and unsettling. Because no director minds being compared to Kubrick. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would Dude, compare I Christian <laughs> Albert to Kubrick in that uh, The Shining does this exact same thing, where if you pay attention to the rooms and the cuts and the hallways in mm-hmm. the hotel in the movie The Shining, the uh, they don't make any sense. You, if you try yeah. to draw like a map of, of the floor plan, none of it really makes any sense. And you know, supposedly that is done intentionally to make everything feel a little dreamlike and mm-hmm. not real. Dude. And then, you know, decades later, they might take that uh, hotel and use it in a very similar movie to this called Passengers. <laughs> oh, yeah. It space. all fits together. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Throughout the movie, Bauer meets three survivors, a German woman named Nadia, a Vietnamese man named Man, <laughs> and uh, a, I think he's a cook. But he's a completely insane, crazy, dangerous cook named Leland. The interesting thing here is that none of these survivors' names are ever spoken 
through the entire movie. You That's only why learn you their call names. Them the in German the lady. <laughs> yeah, German lady, the Vietnamese guy. I thought it was interesting that Nadia, the, the German woman, um, she seems to want his shoes. Uh, she tells him to take off his shoes. I guess she like sees him and she's like, oh, he looks like he's the same size as me. I could use an extra pair of boots. <laughs> I, I think he's not the same size as me. I don't but think so either. But he should have just told her about the overhead boot compartment that he fell into right. earlier. I was going to say, if he's hallucinating <laughs> this, perhaps he's just still stuck. Right. On I think he's just thing. thinking about boots because he ended up in a boot compartment. <laughs> Wait, and she he wants thought my that boots. was really weird. <laughs> like, it's so weird. And also, if you have a boot compartment, why would you put it? overhead like boots well, need she's... to go near the ground <laughs> the whole thing yeah, of, that I, whole I scene thinking is that too. weird to me <laughs> like if i was organizing boots i would put them near the ground that's all i would say i i think you'd have to be some kind of psychopath to put a boot compartment <laughs> wow. over people's heads it's just weird or at least, right <laughs> at least a psychopath to imagine that's where they are <laughs> yeah exactly before he runs into nadia he sees who he thinks is Nadia, but is actually a man who is hanging from like a tripwire trap that's mm -hmm. wrapped around his neck. Yeah. And then later on in he a scene shortly following guy. this, he, uh, he goes down like a, the exact same hallway and sees like the exact same guy hanging from the exact same trap noose thing. Only this time he's alive. And also this time he's played by Norman Reedus, who is a very famous actor. So there's an interesting tidbit about that. Norman Reedus had worked with Christian Albert before. And the story goes that he like really liked working with Christian Albert and he heard that Christian Albert was making another movie. So he like begged him for a role. He was like, I'll take anything, just like any, any, even a small role. Just let me be in your movie, thou great director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can tone it down. He heard that Christian Albert was, uh, he was making another movie and he loved working with him so much that he asked if he could be a part of it. And Christian Albert created the character of Shepard just for him. <laughs> Is that true? That's half true. I had a project that's still not made. That was my first uh, professional script, but I was 16 when I, when I first wrote it and I worked on it and reinvented it a couple of times. And finally it got to a point where I was prepping the movie with Norman Reedus as a lead. That was supposed to be um, even before Antibodies, my international feature debut. When I made Antibodies, we were both kind of a little bit frustrated. We still weren't doing this other movie. And then I said, you know, what would be funny if uh, you just do this little bit part where you have one line in German and everything else is, uh, is uh, uh, silent. I don't know if you've seen it, but he's basically the lead for eight minutes and then his part is done. He visited me unrelated um, to that like a year later, and he got in a very, very, very serious car crash in Berlin. And he was now in a foreign country uh, all alone, uh, sh in shock in the middle of the night. And I basically rushed to the hospital and he couldn't travel for, I don't remember exactly, but it was like four or five weeks. He had to go to multiple surgeries. All this time I was basically uh, with him because he needed to translate. I needed to organize visits from friends, all that kind of stuff, right? And then when Antibodies debuted, right when the credits were running, he's like, dude, I want to be in all your movies. A few years later, I called him for some other tiny TV movie, a German one, where basically everyone you would never heard of, and then there's Norman Reedus. In the act. <laughs> you know what his, his fee was? He's like, I do the scene, I fly over, but only if I can do the scene with Romeo, which was my dog that he loved. You know, it's like, I do the scene, but only with Romeo. So, you know, there's a scene in a German TV movie that I don't even have a copy where Norman Reedus is acting with the dog. So that's fun. And then on Pandorum, I didn't make up the role. The role was always there. And he doesn't remember it because I talked about this again with him a few years back when he was already in the middle of Walking Dead craze. And he was like remembering it differently. In my mind, it was 99.9% .9 that he called me and said, dude, I want to be Shepard. And I was shocked. But he doesn't remember. He thinks I asked him to be Shepard. So there's two <laughs> versions. I give you both. Now we know the other side of the story. That is, that is an incredible backstory to a very, very small role in your film. <laughs> On the way to engineering at some point, Bauer saw what he thought was one of the hunters. When he sees that guy, he starts shaking uncontrollably again, which is another symptom of Pandorum. And he knows this because he then calls up Peyton and says, hey, Peyton, 
So Pandorum, have you ever you know felt about the Pandorum? symptoms? <laughs> no, he yeah. specifically asks, have you ever felt the symptoms? <laughs> Which to me is like, I'm feeling the symptoms of Pandorum, <laughs> right? <laughs> like he, he's telling him right. like, hey, so you know how it feels and when you get Peyton Pandorum. And Peyton is just right? like, whoa, Pandorum, why would you even bring that up? <laughs> and then uh, Peyton tells him the story of the Eden. The biggest effing catastrophe in space travel. The flight cautionary tale from hell. This is where we get probably the most descriptive uh, descriptions. <laughs> Shoot, that's good. I mean, Keep going. This is where we get <laughs> like probably it. the most... Uh, because she's little and small. <laughs> yeah, well, this is probably where we get the best description of what Pandorum actually is. Uh, Peyton says two years into their shift, one of the officers had a psychological breakdown. The doctors referred to it as ODS syndrome, but the pilots, we call it Pandorum, drove him insane. He became convinced that the flight was cursed, evil. And then Bauer says, what did he do? And Peyton says, he evacuated the ship. He launched them all into oblivion. 5,000 people sent to their death with the push of a button. Which I, why, why do they have a button to shoot all the hypersleep pods into random directions well, into space? I, I've, <laughs> I have actually heard a lot of people ask that question and even cite that as a reason they didn't like this movie. No, um, I love it. <laughs> I, but I, like I will it. say <laughs> that at the end of the movie, it shows us there's a reason for that. It's so yeah, that you breach. can just shoot people out and they'll float in the water and then exactly. they'll, they'll be okay. <laughs> and in this situation, all these people are asleep. They literally can't do anything so if for example the ship's like on fire and exploding yeah it could be useful to have a button to eject them all what do we know about pandorum it causes people to be irrational to have psychological breakdowns to be paranoid and then to cause the ship to shoot all the hyper sleep pods out <laughs> into space that is that's, <laughs> that's not pandorum. just something that happened once that is a key symptom that happens with pandorum <laughs> it is. Why else would they have included it? <laughs> yeah. It's around this point that Peyton meets Gallo, a figment of his imagination, in the slime tube. <laughs> I love that slime tube that oh, he emerges tube. from. Um, <laughs> it's where you, pretty you birth another version of yourself in your That's own mind. That's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> out of the slime tube. Corporal Gallo turns out to be much like the popcorn. He is not real. I actually like how they very slowly clue you into Gallo yeah they make things the just weirder and weirder and weirder <laughs> well first he's Bain's like naked view. i love it and just shivering and you're like okay but then he and then he's like loose angry and he's like evil <laughs> <laughs> yep. and then the next scene he's randomly wearing a outfit with yep. a big name tag peyton on peyton. the front <laughs> <laughs> it's so good <laughs> and also as soon as peyton's the the, the other the real peyton well <laughs> as soon as <laughs> peyton sees peyton. him <laughs> He gets a nosebleed, and then the next yes. scene, Gallo has Gallo the nosebleed. Gallo has a nosebleed, <laughs> yes. That's really good. It's um, uh, I, I like, I really like this movie. I just think it's so, so well made. Nadia, she takes them to the hypersleep chamber, and she says this is their main hunting ground. Uh, I like that because, like, you know, where are they going to get food? There's no food on this ship. So, like, they yeah. literally have to just kind of wait until hypersleep chambers open up and there's your food. <laughs> like, eat that person. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think it's so well thought out. They're almost yeah. like little uh, um, cans of, of flesh for the mutants, but they're only opening as God puts them through the power mm -hmm. surge. Like, they're God, you know, like from time to time. Mm -hmm. There's a new settler to eat, but only... You know, when when there's a power surge. So I we imagine this primitive culture that revolves all ar around these pods, you know. We talked about Gallo. He explains to Peyton, he says, oh, there's something wrong with the people on the bridge. It was Pandorum. I had to defend myself. And then Peyton's like, oh, yeah, OK, both of them had Pandorum. And Gallo's like, you don't believe me, do you? If you would have seen them, you would have done the same thing, sir. Do you know the symptoms of Pandorum? Orbital dysfunctional syndrome, Pandorum? Ever witness the symptoms firsthand? It's not something you can easily detect. It starts with a shiver, an itch, a slow boil. The, the biological side effects of flying deep space feeding into paranoia. And the paranoid brain feeding the side effects. A downward spiral, a descent into madness. There's no shutting off the heat. No matter what you do, it'll boil over. Don't you believe me? Now, what he's describing here is the plot of the movie, pretty much. It's 
exactly what Bauer is experiencing, how every time he sees something, that thing scares him. And then he imagines how that thing could be worse. And then it gets worse. <laughs> yeah. And then I love how he says, there's no shutting off the heat. No matter what you do, it'll boil over. Because that's what Bauer's trying to do. He has to get <laughs> to the core the to shut off the heat. <laughs> yes. I think there's a purposeful analogy here as for, you know, the descent into madness that Bauer is currently going through, like physically trying to shut off the heat of the ship and the mental state that Gallo describes that you get into when you are experiencing the effects of Pandorum. Gallo also says that uh, we all know Pandorum is greatly affected by any substantial psychological trauma. It has an emotional trigger effect. So I think that this is, again, kind of implying the reason that Bauer in particular might be experiencing Pandorum. Every time he sleeps, every time he closes his eyes, he thinks back to the substantial psychological trauma of his wife leaving him and then him leaving her when yeah. he left the earth. <laughs> Isn't it great um, how like most of the time he remembers her? She's just like posed all angelic on the bed, smiling <laughs> Saying, at him, and batting you. her eyelashes. And then the very <laughs> then last flashback, <laughs> suddenly like, yeah. she's crying and she's like, oh, and <laughs> see, yes. it's like just a complete turnaround. He experienced two kind of intercoupled psychological traumas. One, she left him. Two, he left her. And that together brought about this delusion that the earth is gone, right? Because to him, <laughs> the earth is gone. That is su suspicious no matter what. When yeah, Gallo how can says the they earth got, be gone? Like a final transmission that says you're all that's left, and then they scanned, how? And yes. the, the earth's <laughs> gone. It's just not there. It was there one minute ago, now it's gone. Yes. <laughs> it's like, there would be, you would see a comet, you would see debris if it was yes. destroyed. <laughs> and also, right. what's this, uh, Dennis Quaid suggests, like, it had to have been nuclear, been nuclear. or a comet. And he I'm says, like, it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> quickly only a comet could have destroyed it. Like, nuclear might destroy everything on it, but the planet would still be there. <laughs> now, I don't know how they're doing this scan, but presumably by now, they're, uh, like, six years into the mission. Right, it and would I take believe a very long time. Time. at light speed or actually faster than light speed which i'll explain later but either way for them to scan the earth or any celestial bodies around the earth that sort of scan would have to be conducted at light speed um because right. you would have would to send out like that radio long to waves get back to which them. are light waves to where the earth is and then see what bounces back and so it would take double the amount of time at least yeah. That exactly. it took them to get where they are. So they'd have to wait <laughs> six years to see what happened. And by then, it would be time for the next shift. It's just really weird that they could even receive this message and then that they could perform this scan and then that they could get instantaneous results. It seems like Bauer's psychological trauma creating his greatest fear, which is that the Earth is gone. It will never come back. So eventually, just moving along with the plot, they get uh, caught by the cook, Leland. He puts them to sleep as he tells them the truth that the earth was destroyed and the three on-duty officers received the message, then went nuts, fought, only one survived, and then he decided like to... he puts them to sleep with all this, this, this giant yeah, you know, well, information dump. <laughs> he sure did. <laughs> Exposition I mean, at least it's, city. it's done in a cool way. I like that they portray what happened centuries ago as a legend, yeah. a myth. He right? drew pictures like, of it on the cool. wall. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think he didn't draw those pictures. Someone else did. Like, they were here when he moved in. And they became like his religion is what they're implying. Um, I think it's really cool. I love that kind of like generational information passing. These three officers received the message that Earth had been destroyed. They fought each other. One of them survived. Instead of going back to sleep, he decided to carry out evil experiments on the crew and passengers, uh, opening pods uh, to provide food for the species that he was breeding them into. And then he got bored and went back to sleep. I love the scene. Because the mythology behind Leland, the cook, is that he doesn't. You know, there's these cave drawings in the wall from uh -huh. people that came before him that found this shelter because it's yeah. very easily defensible. Like you have this upper ring. He is interpreting these cave drawings. And that's why his language is so weird. And he's doing yeah. it almost like a song, you know, because he's been, mm. that's all he had for newspaper, you know, and in my mind, he didn't tell it the first time. He he basically tells it while he's drugging them. 
And mm -hmm. for me, that's like a spider in his web. Like he lures them in with food and information and uh, basically gassing them and then later eating them. And uh, by the way, that was funny though, when like, I don't know, was it two years later, I, I saw uh, Predators. Oh yeah! Yes, they had the exact same scene. The same scene. I, know. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought that was oh. uh, very funny for me. Yeah, I, I was. I, mean, I didn't know. I, I caught me unaware. I, I watched it in the theater. I, I thought it was fun, and then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, "That's a little bit like my scene." I'm like, "Wait, a, wait a minute! That's a lot like my scene." It was and then, the exact. And then when the twist scene. comes, I'm like, "Okay, this is really our scene." <laughs> <laughs> no, they they must have been inspired by your film. Is all I can say. <laughs> Uh, there's a cool shot when uh, Gallo, he's standing in front of a mirror uh, and he smashes this mirror. And then there's just like three frames showing Peyton reflected in the mirror as it shatters, not Gallo. So that's pretty cool. Bauer convinces Leland to work with them. They all get out. They all decide to go after the reactor together. Bauer has to crawl over a pit of sleeping hunters, uh, sleeping yeah. mutants. Which it's I, pretty cool I, I how they sleep, scene. isn't I it? I thought it was a cool scene. Yeah. <laughs> well, and again, this is uh, alluding to how uh, we should get Breed on here, but this is alluding to how archaeologists uh, believe that like ancient humans would like you know nest together, um, that like to keep each other warm, they would basically just sleep in massive bundles of people. But I do think it's a little weird how like they're crossing a bridge. The bridge breaks. Man holds it up. Boy, yeah, he's, a he's a man. <laughs> he just like holds it up with one arm. He's like, I with will hold one this gigantic arm. He holds up. metal bridge. It's a big metal bridge. That would be heavy mm -hmm. enough on its it own. Would, as, and it as would we weigh see, as it is. much as like a car. <laughs> <laughs> but he's yeah, holding up with two people like on it. 30 people well. when it falls and they <laughs> die. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so like he's holding it up and Nadia's on it and Bauer is on it. And then Bauer, for some reason, is like, I don't know how Nadia predicts he's going to do this because it's stupid. She's like, don't yeah. let go. And then he and lets like, go. I'm letting go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I think we're supposed to assume he did that to help man, assuming man couldn't hold it up. But I'm like, dude, if he can hold it up at all, I don't think your weight matters. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like he could have kept holding that up for a while, as we see, like he could have kept yeah, holding it up forever. He just drops it just to help them. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, he's so cool. I love man. And then he one V ones, the baddest of the bad guys, the guy who we've been seeing through yeah. the whole movie uh, he takes him on and he beats yeah. him. And I'm just like, yeah. oh, he's so cool. Usually I don't love worlds where everybody can kind of do martial arts. So you hired an MMA fighter? <laughs> no, but I was thinking, you know, this is a few hundred years from now, you know, and uh, already we are doing so much uh, self-actualization and self-improvement online. And everybody takes so much care about how their body is built and how they learn self-defense and I'm like you know in this future society that is so overcrowded and is so dangerous of course they would all learn these kind of techniques it's nothing for me it wasn't like they're all civilians but they have some fighting moves the guy he beats is like the leader of the hunters the strongest hunter we've seen him lots of times he's dangerous mm -hmm. he's bad news he's the boss of the movie and he's yep. beaten by man man takes him on one on one it yeah, took one -on -one. three of them to kill like to a kill grunt. that other random dude yes <laughs> this is the chieftain here <laughs> you know this is the boss and then he dies fighting a kid exactly that, that that's that's where i'm going with this first of all he is also like he's literally sacrificing himself for the greater good right here so it's actually okay to kill him here yeah because he is doing it to lead this army of hunters away from yes, people who so are fixing the reactor the so they don't all die fix the reactor, yeah. <laughs> right he's so, so it is cool. actually okay to kill him here except that he wins which is cool because he's awesome and he beats the boss of the whole movie and mm -hmm. then to do a surprise kill seconds after that like, it's a callback, but what is it saying? He wanted to kill that baby earlier, and they right. Nadia stopped him, which turned out to be a bad idea then. <laughs> yes. And then he sees the baby again, continues to not kill it, and it's also a bad idea. <laughs> like, it's, it's like they wanted some sort of small arc here, but... I think that the message is, like, compassion is human. Nature is uncaring, right? Like nature doesn't give a crap. And these things are just evolved from nature and they don't care about you and they're just going to do their thing. And, you know, if you show compassion, it will come back to yeah. you. I think more that's likely this represents the strong, self-sacrificing, sympathetic part of Bauer's mind being killed 
And wow. he goes totally psycho after this because he okay. doesn't have his conscience, <laughs> which Works he couldn't understand me. anyway, because <laughs> it speaks a different language than he does. <laughs> So Bauer gets back to the bridge, right? We find out that Peyton was Corporal Gallo all along. He was younger and lower rank than Bauer uh, originally. He's just been awake longer. Also, he injects himself with a sedative that seems to yeah. stop uh, it his doesn't do anything to him. like he's, split he's personality, like... but doesn't cure his psychosis. <laughs> and it doesn't put him to sleep. He's like able to <laughs> 1v2 them in just a second. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. That's probably the only reason they had to get rid of man, because if he was there, yeah, he, absolutely, movie would have been over. He would have destroyed Peyton. But I really love how surprised, like how genuinely surprised Peyton is when Bauer announces that uh, he says, "You're the one who received the final transmission. You stayed awake. You broke the rotation. You killed your crew." And then Peyton looks up with like puppy dog eyes and is like, "Huh? How? How the?" hell would you know that which is a good question (laughs) how would he know that like he might have guessed a lot of stuff that was going on but not that (laughs) it's i think it's supposed to be that he somehow gathered that from the story leland was telling which no and makes sense from a viewer perspective because we got hints along the way but if you just listen to leland's story it actually doesn't make that much sense no like like if you're just listening to it like insane he told it in a really weird like he was god came on and and God went back to sleep. <laughs> like yes. it's it's like a religious sermon. <laughs> it really feels like a religious or a legendary experience that he's. That guy was I great. He's been a, a kind of a small time struggling actor for a long time, and Pandorum was a big turning point uh, for him. For me, it's very tragic that he died, but I'm also happy that uh, that he had such an interesting time because we shot this in Germany at Studio Babelsberg, and he is from LA and he traveled here and he w- used to be homeless for a while. And then he picked wow. himself up, he got into acting, and then he won the casting against some big names. And he was so into it that he felt like this set has to be lived in for him because he's supposedly lived there for a long time. So he slept in the studio in this in the set to live there to, before his big scene. <laughs> he slept on the set? <laughs> yeah, for like three feet. And you know, these sets are huge. Like they're in big, big uh, factory-like, yeah. uh, you know, buildings. Super scary, I, I bet. Yeah, like, that'd be so creepy. <laughs> but one night he got caught by security who weren't aware that he was supposed to be there. So he had a really, oh, no. really tough night once where basically <laughs> security held him for a while. He's like, no, no, I'm an actor. I'm allowed to be here. <laughs> oh, so, no. <laughs> Yeah, no, he was uh, the nicest people I ever worked with, and I was uh, very sad to see him go. I was one one dedicated actor. Peyton reveals to them that there are no stars outside. Uh, Something's really wrong. Like, I think that maybe Peyton believes that they have reached, like, the heat death of the universe, and there's no stars left. Seems to be what he believes. (laughs) But he should know that they haven't, because he can see on the view screen right in front of them that they have only been traveling for 923 years. Um, so, and it wouldn't take that long for the heat death of the universe. So it would take like trillions. But yeah, either way, Nadia calls him over and reveals that they're underwater. Suddenly, there's luminescent fish everywhere. They've already crashed and they've been on Tanis all this time. Talking about twists anyway, I, I always thought, okay, one of these ideas was what if they traveled until space time almost is over? Right. And that's where this little yeah. moment comes from when there's no stars that I love. Yep. But uh, <laughs> it's really good. I, really, I, I even love more than these fish show up, which is one of the shots that even we had a very low budget for this effects. But I think these sea creatures are amazing. I really think they're still mm-hmm. hold up today. And for me, that's another twist. The Gallo Peyton twist is the one where clever people would probably guess it. So I always serve that. I'm like, you know, I'm g- going to give little hints for the smart people out there. So they're going to be feeling secure about the, that they figured out the twist. And uh-huh. that was to distract from the even bigger twist that they're underwater and on Tanis. So yep. Double twist. You know, the one twist yeah. is basically not really important and has been done by the likes of Fight Club and, and, and these movies. But that's mm-hmm. not the one we're holding back. The other one is not the real twist. <laughs> And we're also telegraphing it. There's all this water dripping in. There's moss mm-hmm. on the on the walls. Parts of the sec of, of the ship breaking down. But yeah, no one ever what? sees that coming when they watch the movie. One hundred percent. When I watched the movie the first time, I was like, okay, Gallo and Peyton—they're the same person. 
And then I was like, they're underwater. What? <laughs> I never saw that coming. But Bauer decides to pull the sick out of Peyton with a pair of pliers in his mouth. That's yeah, that's weird. So, I mean, this is just representative and the whole scene is representative of Bauer just really losing it. Like he goes nuts in this scene. He's out. Yeah. of. It. There's a weird shot, too, where he looks up and he sees a panel in the ceiling that has been blocked by a wrench. Yeah. But that is something that blocked they by a wrench did in the other room, in the other room, <laughs> no, not they the didn't bridge. Even do they it. couldn't Peyton get into the bridge. It. Peyton did it. Well, he wasn't there, <laughs> which to me, the him seeing that panel in this room implies that he is Peyton because he knew about that panel somehow, which he wouldn't have known about. And he yeah. got confused as to which room he did it in. <laughs> so yeah. he's just remembering it being here when it's actually not. <laughs> and I really like how he's imagining that these creatures, this is the best evidence that they don't yes. really exist. These creatures Absolutely. are coming out of like, like computer panels on the wall, yes. which they couldn't be coming no, out of. It's a computer panel. There's nothing in there. <laughs> and then it's they wires. do come out of it, but then it flashes and it shows, oh, they're just like burned wires. Oh, there were no he, monsters shoots it. he shoots the monster and then he <laughs> sees what's really there and he just shot a computer and he's like, oh, crap. <laughs> and he starts to realize that he's experiencing Pandorum because later on he <laughs> he asks uh, Nadia to confirm to him. He's like, can you see that guy? Can you see him? <laughs> we can see a view screen that Peyton put up to show them how long they've been traveling. And this is the interesting thing. It stops at 923 years. It also has stopped at 4,555 LY. It says distance, 4,555 LY, which I'm assuming means light years. How could they travel 4,555 light years in less than 923 years, unless they're traveling faster than light? The other interesting thing I noticed is that when he turns on the display, it starts out at like 61 mission years and then slowly ticks up to 923 mission years. So I think what happens is that like last time this display was turned on, they were at 61 mission years. So then now it has to like catch up or something. You mentioned that the text in the movie should correspond with the story of the movie. And I noticed one thing that to me kind of confirms that they never reach Tanis. The distance measurement starts high. It starts out, I think it's at like 9,150-ish light years, or it might be 6,150-ish. It's kind of blurry. And then it ticks down. And this is the most interesting and best evidence I have that they never even reach Tanis. It does not tick down to zero. It ticks down to 4,555 light years. <laughs> So they've still got a long way to go. That's all I can say is yeah. that the distance measurement started high. It ticked down and it never ticked down to zero. It only ticked down to 4,555 light years. So it seems to me like they never reached their destination. They're still out in deep space. I mean, that is done in post by... Um, That's what I figured. Uh, so no team. worries. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, I, it's too long ago. It wasn't done on purpose. If it is there, I have to check it out myself. But it's no worries, a different man. set of artists. When when you go into post production, this was done in uh, Czechoslovakia. The the whole post. So yeah. you know, going through nine hundred eighty shots, I might have missed something. I don't know. But maybe it does make sense, and I just have to fresh up what it actually says. I don't know. Maybe yeah, you sure. caught something. Maybe you don't. But I, for me, I was doing this uh, movie one hundred percent certain that uh, they've reached Tanis. As Peyton and Nadia are fighting Bauer, he tries to shoot the monsters that are breaking in and then realizes it's just a computer panel. And his shot causes the window to crack, which then bursts open and starts letting the, the water in. Now, this is a shot from his weird arm thing. Yeah, his riot suppression gun. You can read like they've meticulously documented this weapon. Like there's panels up next to it, which explain everything about it. It's really cool. It explains not only like the optimum range, but also how far it can shoot. Uh, it even describes how you can adjust like the focal point of the gun to change Whoa. its range. Like That's you have cool. to use apparently you have to use a special wrench, which is provided in the case that the gun is stored in. And you have to adjust like the discrepance disc or something <laughs> manually with this wrench. Is really he cool. needs I one love of those focal length detail. adjusters for his laser razor. I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so cool. It even says 
how much like it, it says the type of ammo it uses. I mean, it doesn't dis- exactly say what it is, but it's measured in milligrams. Um, oh. And it says how much it has and how much it uses per oh. second. Cool. It's very cool that they bothered to make all that documentation about this weapon. Like, that's just amazing to me. I was hiring like for the for the non-lethal weapon, you know, the crowd control weapon uh, and some some of these things. I I hire technical engineers that are working for, you know, like Mercedes or, or Nokia uh, to design future things. That was a real industrial design made by someone who's not working in movies usually and and uh, think about these things. As the ocean pours into the ship. So as they're ascending in this pod that is filled with water, I love how he takes like, so every, each one of these cryosleep pods has a respirator that, you know, is supposed to help you to breathe. He takes the respirator and shoves it into her mouth and commands her to breathe. And then she like is really worried, but she does it. And then immediately and then- <laughs> all the air comes out of her mouth and she like drowns. <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and so that respirator is not working and it's not yeah. working in universe. Like this isn't a mistake because then he looks at the tubes and starts fiddling with them frantically and looks at her and his eyes are wide with horror. And he's like, oh, no, I just killed her. <laughs> it's really good. Like the acting and the writing again is just top notch. The attention to details insane. Like, yeah, of course, the respirator isn't working. This cryosleep pause not active. You more. Moron, you just drowned your girlfriend. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I love it. I, I, I can't get enough of this movie. I love it so much. <laughs> they, they emerge in a calm sea. The cryo sleep chambers in the ship, they are all ejected. And they all slowly, one after another, rise from the ocean. And it seems to be a happy ending. And as the camera pans out to a satellite view, you get the caption, Tan- Tanis Year One, population 1,213. Except that what just happened is exactly what happened to the first guy who had Pandorum, <laughs> right. where he went completely crazy Ejected and he all caused the all the pods to eject into space because he thought that would save everybody. And I'm sure in his mind it did. I'm sure he thought, yes, we're all rising in the ocean and we're all going to repopulate the planet. But then, you know, he died because he didn't. <laughs> and I think that's exactly what happened to poor Lieutenant Bauer. I think he murdered every single sleeping passenger on this ship yeah but that makes sense i mean it's why it's called pandorum why else would you call it that pandorum was yes, honestly inconsequential why? pandorum was completely inconsequential unless it was the ending of the movie and i can't wait to hear uh what Kristen albert has to say about that because i've literally been dreaming of asking him about this for like a decade now This was the whole reason that I signed on to your idea for this podcast, because I was like, someday, if this podcast gets big enough, I'll be able to ask Christian Albert (laughs) if the true meaning of Pandorum was that they all died in the end. (laughs) I'm glad we finally got big enough. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Well, there's there's a thing about endings, right? I I mean, I think that in regular movies, talking mainstream, not so much our movies, uh, or horror movies specifically, I think that every once in a while there's a movie that has a bad, tragic ending that's a shocker. And I yeah, think really. we all should be grateful for this one movie because it makes the happy endings of the 99% of other movies more tense because you're never sure. In horror, it's the other way around. In horror, I almost check out because I know all oh, these motherfuckers, they're going to kill everyone at yeah. the end anyway. And- <laughs> So when it comes to Pandorum, I was like, you know, we killed enough people. Um, it, everybody expects us to go super dark because the movie telegraphs that. So it's actually a nicer surprise yeah. to have a somewhat happy ending. I mean, it's still, they're on a strange foreign planet with hardly any equipment and they have to survive this shit. So it's not like super, super happy, but it is optimistic. Let's put it this way. Talking about theories. I mean, the whole metaphor for me was we are all on a spaceship that we share. Right, right? it's life. And mm. things, things are out of whack and we're basically fucking it up and we fucked up planet A and now they're on mm. planet B. There's a few really cool deleted scenes. Um, <laughs> there's a hilarious alternate version of Bauer uh, waking up from his cryosleep pod where uh, as soon as he has like, you know, regained his wits, um, he gets up off the floor and just like, rushes back to the pod and 
grabs the nourishment tube and starts guzzling down the blue fluid from within it, just like greedily slurping it up and sucking and sucking on it. And then as he's doing this, the camera slowly pans over and he spots a gigantic sign that says, Warning! Do not ingest enzyme fluid after awakening from hypersleep. Oh, and then no. his eyes get wide and he starts <laughs> throwing up everywhere. It's so oh, good. It was that hilarious. I don't know why they deleted <laughs> it it was so funny it was amazing i mean i guess it didn't have quite the tone that they wanted but like that was quality comedy like i was I, laughing actually like, that's <laughs> kind of an important scene though because it explains why they had to eat other people <laughs> to survive yeah, i guess because yeah, <laughs> you could just the suck juice. on the enzymes there was this fear by some of the producers that this is you know i don't know like funny or bad funny or something but to me, it was, again, super interesting. And it was, you know, a nice little moment that I love that fleshes out this world a little bit more. And I didn't yeah. think it was funny. I thought it was great. And you know? I know there's like an alternate ending, which I was really, I, I did not expect this at all. But it had Peyton uh, slash Gallo surviving and draining the water out of the ship. And then behind him, Gallo's standing there. And he's like, well, if you're going to be captain, what are we going to do now? And then Peyton smiles. What was that all about? <laughs> that threw me for a loop. Was he going to be like the main bad guy in the sequels or something? <laughs> yeah, that was an idea. Like I said, you you toy around with things. Um, we wanted to do two more movies uh, if this yeah. had been more successful. Um, the, the idea was that the second movie would go back to Earth and start this massive undertaking of building the spaceship in space. Young Gallo basically being already kind of weird and being someone who is not chosen for the for the uh, uh, mission and he takes the place of his brother by killing him in his space elevator all these things <laughs> oh. and it was uh, it was basically getting the timeline a second time to um tennis uh, where the first act or half of a movie we didn't really develop it uh, to a script form but where basically you start on earth again and then mm -hmm. end up telling what we already know in a in an interesting way about the hunters and how they came to be in another group of survivors, and they also end up in Tanis, so that we have a set of characters that is interesting enough and well known. And then the third movie was supposed to be um, both group of characters that we know from both movies together on Tanis in a new planet with new threats and new politics and how to conquer a planet. So that was the the trilogy idea where um, that I loved and where there was many, many cool concepts that we would have put in there. And if yeah. it's all in Bauer's head, then uh, there's no way you can. <laughs> that wouldn't work. There is a very active Facebook group called Fans for Pandorum Sequel. Um, it's uh, It's got lots of people and they've all joined up and they're all just like clamoring for a sequel to Pandorum. Um, yeah, no they're super posting. nice people. <laughs> They invited me. I joined them. I sometimes oh, yeah? post on it. Uh, so, you know, under my real name. So you can find me there. And you know what it turned into? In the in the beginning, they were enthusiastic because there were some um, examples of fan movements reactivating or re rejuvenating um, projects, you know. So they were trying to do that in the beginning, uh, which didn't pan out. Uh, but... Yeah. It basically is still a nice group of like-minded people that recognize each other through Pandorum, but they recommend mostly other movies, books, TV yep. shows right now for <laughs> fans of Pandorum. And I think that's a nice thing. Is it true that your your daughter was turned into a monster for, for Pandorum? Yes. <laughs> the greatest monster in Pandorum is my daughter, who is not a monster at all. She's, a, she's actually... A, a uh, uh, part-time actress still she's uh, she has a big part in Slowborn. Uh, that was her first role and she i didn't know she was going to show up at the casting she just went on her own because that was a kids casting because we needed kids to be in these uh, costumes and she just went and she was really honestly the best one in this in this casting and i didn't think so myself but my ad who did the casting came to me and says, you're not going to like this. Uh, the one I think is the best is your daughter. And I'm like, oh, I have not, no problem with it whatsoever. But she did long hours in makeup and is very hard to do that. And uh, she was also a little bit disturbed when I told her not to eat the guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she she was fine. I mean, she was like nine or something. Yeah. Yeah. She was really young. 
I, I was super proud how she did it. I think that's one of the best scenes in the movie is when she kills Mon. I, she's just super creepy. And that I mean the way she kills her head and all that stuff. She she she's had good. a knack for she had a knack for it. I don't know. She was really cool. Yeah. So there is another theory that I thought of while watching this that uh Pandorum is a prequel, midquel to Passengers. If you don't know Passengers, uh it's a movie that we covered in the past. That was a good episode, so you should listen to it. Yeah. Um, it's a 2016 film episodes. with Chris Pratt uh, and Jennifer Lawrence. And it's about a guy waking up alone on a ship. It's it's very similar to Pandora. Okay, so here are my evidences that this could possibly even be the same ship. The ships look exactly the same. They look it's exactly a long cylinder that is ship. circled by sharp round things mm. <laughs> I yep. don't even know really how to describe them except that it is it's just yeah circled by these weird spiky arms both the ships look like that and that seems a little odd to me the pandorum ship is called the elysium and it's going to tanis the passenger ship is called the avalon and it's going to homestead 2 now elysium and elysium and avalon are both kind of like these mythological similar kind of sounding names and homestead 2 is clearly a nickname they could the planet could honestly or like be called a scientific tanis. designation right? yeah <laughs> the planet could be called tanis we don't know now interestingly though the elysium its travel length was supposed to be 123 years the avalon and passengers its travel length was supposed to be 120 years which is Ooh, pretty similar that's too close for comfort <laughs> now yeah supposedly the Avalon is only carrying 5,000 passengers and the Elysium was carrying yeah. like 60,000. Well, there you go. It can't be the same. How are you going to reconcile that? <laughs> well, I mean, by the end, it's only like 1,200. Maybe just another oh, 6,000 right. died. <laughs> There's not even 5,000 people. <laughs> they were planning for most of them to die. It was like, <laughs> they were like, well, we know they won't all make it, so we'll just say 5,000. But I, I think it's just, I mean, there are obviously ways to prove this, this thing false, but I think it's a fun thought experiment to just sort of imagine it if you've seen both, because there are just similarities with like, they wake up and, oh, somebody's been trying to break into the bridge. And then you see it from Chris Pratt's perspective in Passengers, and he was spending most of his time trying to break into the bridge. You could make the argument that Chris Pratt from Passengers woke up, he did his thing, he woke up Aurora, eventually killed her, as we proved, put himself back to sleep, but they had kids, and their kids just kept, you know, inbreeding and turned into mutants and ended up destroying Whoa. the ship so it doesn't look nice anymore. And then uh -huh. when other people wake up, uh, you know, like at the end of Passengers, when all the people come out, the, the ship is like, you know, covered overgrown. in... Overgrown. It's overgrown, <laughs> yeah. I think that's the good evidence that the ship changed and it's possible the rest of it looks all like dark and <laughs> murky yeah. and, and drippy. And, they just and also their inbred the children are running around passengers. hunting people down. So, yeah. uh which is kind of the plot of this movie. Dennis Quaid woke up and then went back to sleep after ruining everything. You know, that's that's what Chris Pratt could have done. There is. You know, whether or not anyone's willing to admit it, I can see where some of the ideas and concepts and even, like, shots and, like, cinematography uh, in Pandorum have influenced, like I said, big budget, like, Hollywood movies, um, like Predators and uh, pa Passengers. Um, and even other oh, other sci-fi movies, movies. borrowed from this. <laughs> yeah, Pre Pre Predators, Passengers, Pandora. Pandora. Oh man. <laughs> anyway, I just think that it shows that you know, even if it might not be the most well-known sci-fi movie, and even if it didn't have the reception that they'd hoped for, um, it is legitimately a very good sci-fi movie, um, and it deserved yeah. to you know make a lot more money and make a way bigger splash than it did. So if you yeah. haven't seen Pandora, you should go see Pandora. Yeah. Um, I think your theory is good. Like we've already talked oh, about yeah, so why wait, call it Pandorum unless think? it's really about Pandorum, which it is. And he does yes. the thing you do when you get Pandorum, which is eject everyone. The film ends with the main character, Bauer, who has been shaky, mentally unstable. And then we find out hallucinating <laughs> and believing that the ship is evil and cursed to the point where he's incredibly paranoid. I just I can't get over the fact that they introduce Pandorum as being the disease that makes yeah. you eject all of Why the hypersleep pods. Why show the flashback? Pods. And then the movie ends with him ejecting all the hypersleep pods. It's like, <laughs> yeah. come on. He and I like Pandorum. the way it doesn't spell it's the it out. It's the title of the like, movie. Most people who watch this will just take it at face value. Yeah, he saved the day. He got away from the mutants. No, <laughs> but, he killed them all. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. 
it's this theory for me is not correct, specifically since we wanted to do two more movies. Uh, if this yeah. had been more successful, we'll have to get you those two sequels. Uh, <laughs> then we can answer those questions. Well, actually... I'm so busy, but I was, you know, I sometimes <laughs> get questions, and Travis, the writer as well. I mean, he's one of the uh, uh, absolute creators of this, and we both get sometimes questions about how, what if we do a comic book? What if we do a novel? Dude, you and... should. That would be awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, music for this episode was provided by Christine. Extra special thanks to Christian Albert for you know being willing to come on the podcast. Super fun talking to him and meant a lot to me. I've always wanted to ask him about Pandorum. So, you know, this is like a, a great uh, wish being fulfilled for me. So besides that, uh, if you want to show us your support, you can find us on Patreon. If you like what we're doing, want us to keep doing it. We are a completely independent podcast. Um, we are not owned by any other company. Yeah. We are not beholden no to sponsors, any sort of corporate no rules ads. or laws. We have no sponsors. Um, we pay for everything out of our pocket, and we are also not trying to make a profit doing this podcast. If you like what we're doing and you want us to keep doing it, every every single bit of support counts. So head on over to Patreon and uh, support us today. It, it really means the world to us. So that was fun, guys. Uh, great to be here. Have fun with this episode. And always remember that popcorn isn't real. <laughs>